So the topic for today's didactic is um, non-alcoholic fatty liver disease, especially in people with diabetes or in relationship to diabetes. So we're gonna talk about what is non-alcoholic fatty liver disease, why is it important and what we can do about it. So uh, NAFL D or non-alcoholic fatty liver disease is the buildup of excessive fat in the liver cells not due to alcohol. So for years and years, fatty liver was mainly caused by excessive alcohol ingestion. And then as the obesity and diabetes epidemic took hold, we started to see this other cause for fatty liver. Now the liver normally has uh, usually less than 5%, but definitely, definitely less than 10% uh, fat in the liver. If you get more than that, it's just called fatty liver or steatosis. And we've learned that this fat in the liver can cause chronic inflammation and inflammation then triggers the formation of scar tissue or fibrosis. So fibrosis or scar tissue, if it replaces all the cells in the liver, obviously the liver can't do its job because it's just a wad of scar tissue instead of normally functioning liver cells. So as you move from just plain fatty liver to this inflamed, swollen, damaged liver, it's called NASH or non-alcoholic steatohepatitis. So it's a, it's a form of hepatitis, not caused by virus, but caused by fat. So in the United States now, this NAFLD is the one of the most common after hepatitis C or up there with hepatitis C causes of liver disease in the United States with 30 to 40% of adults having fatty liver, some form of it, either just the plain fatty liver or the inflamed fatty liver. And 10% of children, which is really concerning, across the whole world, 25% of the population has fatty liver of some form. And that's highest in the Middle East countries where obesity and diabetes is also uh, really High, like Saudi Arabia, et cetera. So the majority of people, thank goodness, only have the fatty liver, but 20 to 30% of the people who have NAFLD have this inflammation and fibrosis. And then in the United States, that's three to 12% of the adults. In people who have type two diabetes, 76% of people with diabetes have some form of NAFLD and in 56% of them, it's the NASH, the, the hepatitis form, the inflammation and fibrosis. And right now in the United States, if you see a patient with diabetes with elevated liver enzymes, the most common cause is NAFLD. It doesn't usually show up with symptoms, so it's considered silent until they get to liver failure or cirrhosis. So this is the continuum and kind of pictures of what the liver looks like, the normal liver moving to all the fat in the liver, but no inflammation, no cell damage, the ballooning. As you get into the NASH or hepatitis caused by the inflammation, caused by the fat, you start to see uh, the, the cell damage and then that turns to scar tissue or fibrosis. Um, so that's the uh, natural progression or continuum. And of course, we'd like to prevent that. So right now we think that the, the, um, the environment of all that fat is toxic, lipotoxic. And it may not be only the fat in the liver. It may have to do also with um, the nutritional components that contribute to that fat. In particular, the high fructose corn syrup has been called out repeatedly. And they describe a classic dietary characteristics of people who get NAFLD with diets higher in saturated fat and cholesterol, lower in the polyunsaturated fats, lower in fiber, and lower in antioxidant type vitamins that you get from things like fruits, vegetables, uh, et cetera, whole grains also higher in those soft drinks with, with the sugar and fructose 
liquid, we know that that contributes more to liver damage and more to obesity. Um, and then higher calorie intake overall, as well as the high fructose intake, which isn't just in, um, in the sugar sweetened beverages, it's in other, there's other sources as well. Um, so NAFLD is a complexity of the genetic tendency to get um, fatty liver, which is increased uh, for instance, Mexican Americans tend to have some of these genes more than other populations do, or some genes might be protective. Also, the uh, type of food intake and then the gut microbiota, we've, we've talked about how it can contribute in an earlier didactic, and then epigenetic changes. So there's a lot of things that contribute, but um, diet and weight are huge. So why is it important? Well, once you get to the uh, steatohepatitis stage or NASH, you're on the pathway to cirrhosis and liver failure. And that includes the much heightened risk of getting liver cancer, which is called hepatocellular carcinoma or HCC. So, if we look at the data, once someone has NASH, and I'll show you the data in a minute, people have a much higher chance of dying of liver-related causes. They have a higher all-cause mortality and much higher chance of dying either from that liver cancer or liver failure. Unfortunately, in most liver disease, the, the cancer isn't really increase, the risk for that cancer isn't really increased until they get to all the way to cirrhosis. But in NAFLD, the risk starts increasing before they're all the way to cirrhosis, when they're still in the fibrosis stage two and fibrosis stage three um, stages. And this is especially increased in people who have obesity and diabetes. So the risk of liver cancer goes up in people with diabetes and obesity, as does the risk of cirrhosis and liver failure. And when I was in Atlanta, I was the endocrinologist on a liver transplant unit. And when you get to that stage, you either get a transplant or you go to hospice. And so cirrhosis and liver failure can be a leading cause of death. In addition, the most common cause of death in people with NAFLD is cardiovascular, and they seem to have an accelerated cardiovascular risk. Um, people often will not prescribe statins if they think that the person has liver disease, but over and over and over again, it's emphasized that statins are safe. And I don't know if you guys remember, but we talked about how Mayo Clinic did this huge study that showed that metformin is safe as well, because it reduced the development of hepatocellular carcinoma and a lot of the complications of cirrhosis. So um, this patient is not taking metformin for other reasons, but just because her ALT is elevated, if she could tolerate the metformin, it would be beneficial. Also, if she needed a statin, which she doesn't, uh, it would not be contraindicated and would be beneficial. The patient that Tashina uh, presented with the ALT of uh, 55. So this is the data, uh, and this was a meta-analysis where they looked at a lot of different studies, and uh, that's why the range is so big. But if you just look at these numbers for all-cause mortality, the more fibrosis in the liver, the more scar tissue, the higher the all-cause mortality, and much, much higher risk of liver-related mortality. And so we know that people with obesity and people with type two diabetes have a much higher risk of the fibrosis and are more likely to have the advanced fibrosis stages. And so this is putting our patients at risk. Um, this is just a, a graph showing the same thing. So the light blue is normal, no liver, no fatty liver. Uh, and then as you get more and more fibrosis, the survival get shorter and shorter, even by 10 and 20 years. We're not talking one and two years here. 
So um, we talked about on a previous uh, Diabetes Echo how a patient was angry because she was told she had cirrhosis and she didn't use alcohol and she didn't know how she got cirrhosis. And I had had that experience in my own practice because this is a very sneaky uh, condition. Um, often it's not at all uncommon for people to only realize or we clinicians to realize they have anything wrong with the liver once they're at an advanced fibrosis stage such as cirrhosis. Um, so it's because we don't think about anything being wrong with the liver if the liver enzymes are normal. And as I'll get into more of that in the next slide, it's very common for people with even NASH, an advanced irritated damaged liver to have normal enzymes. And then it, the ultrasound and the CAT scan don't show fat until it's over 30% and normals really under 5%. So these aren't very sensitive at picking it up. But if we're gonna change that natural history of people going all the way to cirrhosis, dying of liver failure or getting liver cancer, we need an earlier diagnosis. And the good news is even as long as you don't have fibro fibrosis stage four or liver cirrhosis, it's reversible. And the main thing that causes it to be reversible, as we'll see, is diet and weight loss. So there is a lot of hope here. It's just not easy to lose weight in our society. So th this is what I told you we'd get more into looking at the liver enzymes. Having a persistently elevated ALT can indicate that you're progressing from fatty liver to NASH, but it doesn't predict it and 53% of people who only have fatty liver and don't have any NASH, don't have any hepatitis, have a persistently elevated ALT. On the other hand, 60% of people who have gone on into NASH have a normal ALT. I mean, so it's like, what, you know, how are we supposed to find people? Uh, hepatologists would prefer if the normal ALT level was lowered from 40 to 20 for women and from 40 to 30 for men. And all the lectures I've gone to by hepatologists say, please, if you see ALTs in someone with the risk factors over 20 for a woman or over 30 for a man, at least think about um, looking more into their liver. Now in alcoholic liver disease, we were used to seeing the AST going high, but it doesn't go high in non-alcoholic fatty liver disease until the fibrosis is getting bad. So you'll often see an ALT with a normal AST, but when that AST starts to go high, it's really indicative in, in non-alcoholic fatty liver disease that the fibrosis is uh, getting uh, bad, getting worse. Um, as I already said, most cases are silent. Rarely the patient might have pain over the liver or might feel tired just from the effects of the liver. On exam, a lot of times I could feel a big liver. I don't know how many of you are doing um, those kind of exams on your people when you see them for diabetes, so you may not be the one to pick this up. And if they have a really fat tummy, it can be hard to push through all of that a visceral adiposity to find the liver, but I have seen quite a few people with NAFLD with a big liver. And then as we already talked about, an, the ALT might be high. Another thing that might happen is that they get um, an ultrasound for some other reason. Do they have gallstones and they can see, oh, it looks like there's fat in the liver or they have kidney stones and you get a CAT scan. And so they might say, well, the liver looks fatty but the ultrasound and the CAT scan don't pick that up until the fat content is over 30%. The most accurate is if for some reason you got an MRI in a patient for back pain or something, and they said we can see fatty liver, that's more sensitive. Um, but I know for a lot of times people would see an elevated ALT and order a CAT scan. If you're gonna order anything that just to have a less expensive uh, 
it would be the ultrasound unless they're really, really obese because the CT is not any more accurate and it has a higher cost and higher radiation. So if we're gonna recognize NAPLD, we have to recognize the risk factors. And, and um, it makes it frustrating, but uh, that's what we're left with because there's no reliable symptoms and the findings can be hit or miss. The ALT may or may not be elevated and we don't wanna get an MRI on everybody. So the strongest risk, risk factors for non-alcoholic fatty liver disease is obesity, especially central obesity, the apple obesity versus the pear, diabetes, high blood pressure, age over 50, obstructive sleep apnea, and the metabolic dyslipidemia where the low HDL, the high triglycerides um, are part of the picture. Now, diabetes makes people more prone to getting fatty liver, but if somebody has fatty liver, they're more prone to getting diabetes or at least prediabetes, so it goes both ways. The risk factors for the fatty liver going on to hepatitis, fibrosis, and cirrhosis also include diabetes. Anything that causes insulin resistance, persistent weight gain, high blood pressure, and as we see that AST uh, uh, level coming up, that's uh, in indicative of progressive uh, fibrosis. So the risk factors that can be modified are in orange, the ones we really can't change your age or gender, ethnicity or genetics. Um, but this shows that even early before cirrhosis, that hepatocellular carcinoma risk starts to go up, um, just reinforcing why it's important. So right now, the uh, American Association for the Study of Liver Disease does not recommend screening um, because treatment is directed at risk factors. New drugs are in the pipeline that, that are targeting fibrosis and People are also looking at some of our diabetes drugs as possible treatments. Pioglitazone has been looked at and does work. So if you have biopsy proven NASH and diabetes, you can use pioglitazone. Um, it's not recommended in everybody. Um, in people who don't have diabetes, 800 units of vitamin E has been recommended, but not in people who have diabetes. Um, so because there's no good treatment, they recommend not screening. Remember screening is if there's something you can do about it. In a way there is something we can do about it because we're gonna talk about that in a minute. But even though we don't screen, especially in people with diabetes, we need to have a high index of suspicion. And Dr. Um, Curry, has Kusi, excuse me, has published a lot on fatty liver, NAPLD in people with um, diabetes. And the February issue of Diabetes Care has a series of articles, February 2020 issue, has a series of articles on NAPLD. So he has an article in there where he looked at um, NAPLD and the various stages in people with type 2 diabetes and found that about 15% of people with type 2 diabetes have moderate or severe fibrosis and cirrhosis. He also found that the AST-ALT ratio was better at indicating that than this really expensive panel that you can order from one of the lab companies. I forget if it's LabCorp or who it is, but um, it was it was better uh, as, and more reliable. Mm -hmm. um, so one thing to remember is that people can have another cause for fatty liver or can have more than one cause for fatty liver. And of course we know alcohol, hepatitis C and certain medications. And I have a list of some of those medications at the end. So what, what do we do about fatty liver? Well, no standard treatment exists, as I just indicated. So we need to treat the underlying conditions such as obesity, diabetes, obstructive sleep apnea, et cetera, hyperlipidemia, et cetera. 
So the first step is to identify those underlying conditions that we can modify. So we can't modify their age, you know, their genetics, but we can modify some things such as these uh, things. And when someone smokes, they have a higher risk of fibrosis. So if we talk to somebody who has pancreatitis, if they smoke, they're more likely to get chronic pancreatitis. You know, the same thing uh, with people who drink alcohol and smoke, they're more likely to get cirrhosis than if they don't smoke. But not only that, smoking increases the risk of hepatocellular carcinoma. So another reason, I know we're, you guys already work on this, but another reason is that um, it will increase the progression to liver failure and the progression to hepatocellular carcinoma. And an article just came out showing that in people who have alcohol-induced liver disease, being obese increases their, uh, accelerates their liver damage. So sort of synergistic damage there. So treatment of obesity and weight loss is the foundation of care. Even a little weight loss can make a big difference. So dropping the weight by four to 10% consistently improves liver fat. Um, and sometimes the, the inflammation, the, the worse the inflammation, the more weight you need to lose. But I mean, this is, this is pretty good news. You don't have to lose 25% of your body weight. Just reducing BMI by 5%, you get a 25% reduction in liver fat. So the, this is for people with uh, NAFLD that you emphasize to them just losing 10% of your body weight is enough to reduce the inflammation. Just 5% is enough to reduce the liver fat. If you can't do that with diet and exercise, I mean, they even recommend talk about weight loss medications or weight loss surgery. Now, we can help our patients with diabetes here because of the GLP-1 receptor agonist and the SGLT2 inhibitors, uh, especially the GLP-1 receptor agonist are looking like good weight loss medications in addition to helping reduce the blood sugars and helping to reduce the liver fat. And I've got uh, some links uh, for you. Um, Dr. Kusi says, you know, try to lose at least 7% to reduce inflammation. And if there's fibrosis, try to lose at least 10%. And he's, he's quite the, the current expert on this in um, the diabetes world. Try to have your meals, what kind of calories you eat, reflect the Mediterranean diet, you know, many, more of the monounsaturated, polyunsaturated fats, less of the saturated, more fresh and frozen vegetables, olive oil, nuts instead of the saturated fat. Avoid the high fructose products, especially don't drink sugar-sweetened beverages or Gatorade, that type of thing. Try to build up some physical activity. Here it says one drink daily for women, two for men, but some people really suggest telling your patients any alcohol can make it worse. And then thinking about getting immunized for hepatitis A and B, so that there's no additional uh, damage from viral infections to your to the liver. So what what's a possible approach in the clinic? Well, I think for all of our people with diabetes, emphasizing weight loss and diet change, not just losing weight by eating, you know, Reese's peanut butter cups, you know, but what you eat as well as losing weight, because that high fructose is bad, um, high saturated fat is bad for the liver. If the patient has an elevated ALT, like our patient today, or you got a, a they had kidney stones and you saw fatty liver on the CT, or, or someone felt a big liver on exam, then the recommendation is to do by history, you know, how much alcohol do you drink, et cetera, et cetera and lab screening to rule out other causes of liver disease or coexisting causes, uh, such as the viral hepatitis panels, the iron studies to look for hemochromatosis. And no, hemochromatosis undiagnosed 
not only causes liver damage, it can cause diabetes. So that's always good to keep in mind. Um, autoimmune liver disease, check the thyroid. And if your patient has fatty liver but doesn't have diabetes, being sure they don't have diabetes and being sure they don't have dyslipidemia is important. Once you've done those tests, then looking to see what their risk of having advanced fibrosis is. And I've given you some links to these less expensive but more accurate tools, uh, risk stratification tools, and we'll go over that in a minute. If they, by these tools, they have a low AST, their AST to ALT ratio is well below one, the FIB4 score is low, the NAFLD score is low, then encourage weight loss, treat the components of the metabolic syndrome and any sleep apnea, and keep reassessing them annually. But if they have an intermediate or high risk, everybody suggests GI referral. Well, I know that's hard for your patient population. There's a ultrasound test that measures the fibrosis in the liver. And if you can get that test, it's a fairly inexpensive test and has fairly good accuracy. Anything with a score over 7.5 suggests advanced fibrosis then they could probably be sent to GI. Uh, high risk would be age over 50, obesity, and diabetes. Uh, one of the things you can always check because low platelets are a really good indicator that the patient has developed cirrhosis unless they have another reason for low platelets. So that's kind of a cheap way to say, you know, what are their platelets? Are they trending down? Are they below normal? as a good way. So this is kind of an approach in the clinic. These are the links. So this FIB4 was originally developed for hepatitis C patients, uh, but it's been used in patients with NAFLD. And all you need for that is the age, AST, ALT, and platelets. All you need for the NAFLD fibrosis score is age, BMI, albumin platelets, AST, ALT, and whether they have diabetes or not. So these are a whole lot cheaper than that FibroSure panel. And with that FibroSure panel, you still have to provide all of those things. And then just AST to ALT ratio is another um, good indicator. And I gave you a link to one of the calculators for this to kind of have an idea of when it's concerning. So in summary, NAFLD is common in people with type 2 diabetes. It's often silent. And Aside from doing a liver biopsy, which isn't perfect because you only get the biopsy where you go in, so you can have issues with specimen, you can have complications from the biopsy and it's a high cost, but there are no non-invasive gold standard screening diagnosis or monitoring test, as you saw. Uh, NAFLD increases the chance that someone will get type two diabetes. It increases the risk of cardiovascular disease and some studies show other microvascular complications like retinopathy, nephropathy, and neuropathy. And diabetes makes the person more prone to getting the severe forms of NAFLD, including cirrhosis and hepatocellular carcinoma. How much fibrosis they have determines their overall mortality and their liver-related mortality. The problem is it's hard to figure out how much fibrosis they have. And then the good news in all of this is that weight loss can improve and even reverse all stages except cirrhosis. So even here at the inflammation stage, it can still reverse it. And there's really promising data around the GLP-1 receptor agonist and the SGLT2 uh, uh, inhibitors. So I've put some, um, oh, let me just mention this real quick if I have time. I don't even know what time it is. Oh, good, I got a few more minutes. Um, they're, they're considering renaming it metabolic associated fatty liver disease. So I wanted you to be aware of that. And then I put a bunch of extra slides in for you, medications that can be associated with fatty liver. If people have severe weight loss after gastric bypass, they can get it. Uh, if they're non-obese, but they have like triglycerides of 3000 or something, you know, some of these rare syndromes where they have no fat, but the liver, the fat all goes in there. Um, they have severe insulin resistance due to lack of fat and they get a really big fatty liver. 
And then I put several other things in here for you, like the link to the, um, the article on um, semaglutide. So let me escape and stop sharing and see if you guys have questions. Um, and I, hopefully this helps you I, uh, on the fatty, the fatty liver. It's, it's kind of a epidemic right now. And we need to do the best to help our patients. Questions or comments? Great, thank you so much, Dr. Greenlee. Very, very good information there. Um, there is a question in the chat box from Robin asking if there's any data or recommendations on the elevated alkaline uh, phosphatase. On the alkaline phosphatase for fatty liver disease? Um, I haven't seen that, Robin. Um, do you have a patient with elevated alkphos? I mean, the big thing is, do they have bone disease or do they have liver disease? So if you want to uh, tell me a little bit more about that offline, I'll try to help you with that one. Um, oh, I was just asking because I've had a few of the our patients that are surprised, you know, by their diagnosis. And it's usually done, like you said, by an ultrasound or CAT scan or something. Mm -hmm. And their AST and ALTs are normal, but in those patients, the ALKFOS is elevated. And so. Okay. Um, I, I've seen that too. So let me see what the data is on it. Happy to do that. Okay. Yeah. I've seen that too. Yeah. We, so the most of my patients have an elevated ALKFOS, but not the other enzymes. So that's why we're not catching it. So I'm wondering if we need to look at, you know, like you said, the risk factors, but also maybe the ALKFOS could be another thing that we yeah, could look at. Yeah, that'll be interesting to pursue. Thank you. Yeah, because that is something I've seen in patients as well. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Robin, for that question, definitely. And um, Yaka is just giving you a thank you, big thumbs up. Very informative. We also um, are on high alert with mm -hmm. our patients who have liver disease and CKG. Yeah. Ease. Those patients are at really high risk for cardiovascular disease. Um, yeah. And that's all I have on this okay. end. Um, unless anybody else, we are at one o'clock. So if anybody else has any other questions, uh, don't forget to sign in or and the chat box. Janine went ahead and put that up. And um, I wanna thank Janine for all the help that you do. <laughs> Uh, I forgot to introduce her earlier today, as well as Don Head, uh, her are on our team. But again, thank you all for joining us. Yeah. Meryl from the panel, as well as Robin on the panel, and Tashina. I hope you were able to gain some good knowledge out of this session. And as always, Dr.